Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. We are going to be talking today about uh, automatic speech recognition and how it can be applied to air traffic control. Um, so, <laughs> thank you for being here today. This is a part of our series of uh, webinars. And I just wanted to share with you. So the, the last webinars we had, you can see here where the cybersecurity and the innovation in airspace utilization. Today we're doing airspace, uh, sorry, automated speech recognition. Mm -hmm. And um, we have upcoming webinars. This is our tentative program. All our webinars are uh, just the program and as well the replay is available in, in the link that you can see here. Um, so just without further ado, let's get into today's theme. Um, just a bit of housekeeping before. Um, for those of you who have not, we're not familiar with the Livestorm tool, we we have um, and we we really like questions and we really want to interact with you all. But uh, we have different tabs for different things. So we have a, a chat tab. For the chat, you can you can talk, you can share between you. We will also see it, but we're actually only actively monitoring questions, the questions tab. So for the question tab, that's where you want to put your questions. If you put a question in the uh, chat, we may or may not see it. We may actually miss it because the the you know we have many many attendees, and so please put your questions on the on the questions. Then. Um, we strive and we will try to answer all your questions. The questions that are not answered today live, because there will be maybe no time, uh, we will answer later in writing. And then the Q&A is published in together with the replay of the webinar. Um, just to first to introduce myself, which I think I forgot to do. My name for is Olivia Nunes. I work for the CESAR joint undertaking. I am an ADM expert. I have been an operational controller for 20 years, and I work in the SJU. That's the Secretariat that coordinates the CESAR research program. I've worked here since the year 2012. And um, I'm actually very excited about this, this whole theme because it really applies very much to uh, improving the work that I had been doing until I joined the SJU, until I joined the CESAR program. Um, we have four speakers today. I, you can see them all here on the screen. I will be introducing them as, as we go. So our first speaker today is, uh, is uh, really very knowledgeable in this subject. He has been working on this for a very, very long time. His name is Harmut Helmke. Welcome, Harmut. He holds a degree in computer science and a doctoral degree in chemical engineering. And he is uh, an assistant professor in computer science since 2001. And he has been working over the last eight years in uh, several international speech recognition projects. For those of you that maybe this means something, AC Listant, Mallorca, that's a CESAR project. And then he has been working in CESAR industrial research. So that's where we bring things that are closer to being implemented in both wave and, sorry, wave one and wave two. And he is currently the lead in Hawaii which is our expert research project that's uh, looking at the more innovative applications of automatic speech recognition. So, Harmut, welcome to the stage. Thank you, Olivia. Let's try how Technic uh, is working. So, I hope somebody can see my screen. We can, thank you. Okay, then again, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks again for the for the introduction. Well, I think we have Alexa, we have Google, we have Siri, but why we are still needing speech recognition in, in research for air traffic management? Because we already have everything, people may say. Well, I will try to answer this question uh, during the next uh, 20 minutes and maybe also have a question to you for the next 20 minutes. Think about why we are not already using speech recognition in the operational environments of air traffic management, not just in the labs. We are earning the money in the operational environments. Okay, well, I want to start with a, an experiment which I have performed uh, some days ago. I used my iPhone and just spoke that sentence into the iPhone. I hope you can see. Mr. Sherman, again, thank you very much for the invitation. 
and for the opportunity to present my view, my personal view of the application of automatic speech recognition in air traffic management domain. Let's see if at the end of the day, I'm still happy. Okay, I talked a lot of nonsense, 46 words. Uh, that was the iP output of my iPhone. So I a little bit reprepared it here. Here you already see what I have said, the output of my iPhone in the second line. And what you should see, well, really a lot of it's green. Most of it is recognized. That's a feeling. Well, a little bit deep looking in more details, speech recognition people will say, well, we have four substitutions, one addition, one deletion. So at the end, we have an error rate of 13%. Well, we should not say 13%. We should say we had 87% already of recognition rate, yeah, because the glass is already half full, not half empty. Yeah, though a lot of is recognized. So then why we are still needing Siri or not using Alexa, Google, and these things? Well, some people may say we have special data privacy issues. Cloud is not an option. We have, of course, the real-time aspects in air traffic management. We have special phraseology. Therefore, we can throw out uh, Siri or no. Special context information is available. Security, cybersecurity issues, safety issues may be important, or even ATM ma system manufacturers may say, well, we cannot integrate speech recognition from Google or Amazon into our system in the ops room. Yeah, maybe, but I would say everything that are pseudo arguments. Maybe another argument, I performed a second try with my iPhone. I just tried to speak like a controller. Lift number one, Alpha 14, descent flight level 80, reduce 220 knots, contact tower 119, decimal 7, bye. So that's something usual. Yeah, 22 words, output of my iPhone. I compare it again here. Uh, with red, uh, uh, with uh, yellow, and with green colors. Okay, not everything is green again. Yeah. So you see already here nine substitutions. So at the end, we have 59% of word error rate. Okay, this is not a representative experiment, but it already shows a little bit in this demonstration what might be the problem. Of course, you can adapt all these things. Yeah, but you need to do that. And keep also in mind, this is just speech recognition. Nothing is said about understanding. I will come back uh, to that later. The speech recognition is not understanding speech. So what is I needed for speech recognition? Well, I think we know this joke. We need data. Second most important are data. Third most important are data and so on. Why? Well, we need for training our models. We need the voice utterances yeah, to train to different accents, to train to different phraseologies. Yeah, and then we also need, which is a little bit expensive already, the transcriptions, really writing down word by word what is said. And more expensive even to write down the annotations, what we call annotations, or really write down what is the semantics of that, what is you said. Yeah, looking at the data, well, data privacy issues may be here an issue, ethic issues. Here in the transcription, it's really expensive. And even more expensive are the annotations because you need to agree on rules. Yeah, how to annotate that? What is the semantics? No, so, nevertheless, uh, DLR with Saarland University has developed a so-called assistant-based speech recognizer 2014, which we applied for Düsseldorf approach area, and I think we achieved 95% of recognition rate already on command level, not just on rule level. But it was a little bit expensive. I think we spent 1.5 million euros just for adapting for Dusseldorf approach area for one runway. Nevertheless, we think it was successful, but expensive. So if you want to adapt it to other application areas, well, that was the birth of the Mallorca project, which stands for machine learning or speech recognition models for controller assistance. Yeah, here we really used all the radar data, all the voice recordings, well, not all, but a lot are from Vienna and from Prague airport. And we try to use machine learning to automatically adapt the speech recognizers for Prague and for Vienna Airport. So we just try to replace the highly paid experts just for machine learning to make it cheaper. Yeah. And well, using voice data, transcribing them automatically by speech recognition, and then training of these data. I think that's data of the art. That was nothing new in Mallorca. Well, showing in this small bubble, the invention of Mallorca was really to have a second channel using the radar data and then to predict what the controller might say in the current situation. 
And if that does not fit to the output of the speech recognizer, well, it's a good heuristic to divide the recognitions into good and into bad learning data. So then you can only learn from the good data. Or even better, if you know that you have bad data, well, then you can also le learn from bad training data, if you know it, that you have bad examples. So that was the invention of the Mallorca project. And yeah, here are some results. Yeah, for Yana approach, we started with the baseline recognizer and then adding more and more data, though at the end, just 25 hours of data, we achieved 85% of recognition rate on command level. Word error rate was here 5.1%. For Prague, the data was a little bit cleaner, and for Prague for controllers more adept to phraseology. We achieved, we started with 80% and could then improve also with 25 hours of data to 92% of recognition rates on command level. So where we are with speech recognition and machine learning in our roadmap, now we started with the Eglisten project showing that it works. Uh, then we used speech recognition really to quantify the benefits of speech recognition. We could show that compared to not using speech recognition, workload reduces of the ATCO by roughly a factor of three just for the clicking time, which results in reduced flight times, which then reduced in less kerosene consumption. Well, just 60 liters of kerosene could be saved per aircraft with using speech recognition in the final approach. Well, that was shown in the Eglisten Strips project. Then I already mentioned the Mallorca project, machine learning for Prague and Vienna Airport. So here we achieved word error rates of 0.6% for Prague. Next part was in wave one of CESA, where we try to use commercial of the shelf our speech recognition, well, with different success stories, let me say it in that way. Uh, and we continued now in wave two. Uh, in the median, intermediate, we have a project uh, from Clean Sky, uh, the ADCO2 project, uh, which tries to get a lot of training uh, data for voice recordings from air traffic uh, management, though I think they have already recorded 3,000 hours of data and in parallel in these are these are we have the operations of remote tower. That is the next presentation given by Ramona and or in Vienna Ops Room uh, in the Prosa project. Uh, that's a presentation given by Christian and Christian uh, from Auto Control later. And or well, during the next minutes, I will a little bit concentrate on the Hawaii uh, project. Hawaii stands for highly automatic air traffic controller workstation with artificial intelligence integration. Believe me, I trained hard to pronounce all the words. The one application is, well, we have talking the controller, a speech recognizer, and we just want to classify with speech recognition to get a little bit more objective measures for workload if the workload of the ATCO is high, medium, or low. Another application is the integration of speech recognition with CPL DLC, so the controller pilot data link communication. So again, ADCO is talking, we use a speech recognizer, we automatically try to try to recognize the words and also the semantics, or the gold sign here, the command, and maybe the value, and then it's then automatically uplinked to the pilot. Although the, the controller is not talking anymore to the pilot directly, but or, yeah, with, with data link. That's one of the ideas we will investigate. Another one is call sign highlighting. So, uh, in the next talk, um, we, we also have here something uh, with respect uh, to that, uh, though the ATCO is just talking. Uh, and you highlight the call sign, and maybe even more, you just can also highlight or extract the waypoint, what is said. Uh, well, doing that for ATCOs maybe is not so challenging because the ATCO, in most cases, already knows to which aircraft he's talking. So the challenge is really to highlight the call sign of the pilot, which really includes to recognize pilot voice, not only in the lab, but also in the real world environment. And that's the last application, I think the king's discipline here of the Hawaii project, readback error detection. There, ATCO speaks something, the pilot has to repeat what the ATCO says, but of course, not in the same words, but uh, the same semantics. Yeah, though 
A readback error would be, for example, if the ATCO says whiskey, whiskey, 9A2, and the readback of the pilot is just proceed to whiskey, whiskey, 972. Now that we call a readback error, which could also result in safety issues. Now that, that's easy to show on slides. More challenging is maybe yeah, that or ATCO may say, good morning, Speedbird 2000 Alpha. Reduce 1A0 knots until DME 4 miles. Contact tower on frequency 118.700. Yeah, maybe in this way, a trainee is more talking. Yeah, with more experience, uh, I think art goes more and more change their phraseology. And yeah, it could be then for the same that the art goes just says 180 to DMA 4 tower 187 speedbird 2000 alpha. Yeah. Or it could be also the readback of the pilot. So here you really see already, yeah, the challenge. Yeah, is that also a readback error? Be, yeah, because the word sequences here could be different in the readback. Not each command needs a readback. Yeah, the good morning doesn't need a readback. Sequence of commands can be different. Yeah, 19 and 119 are maybe the same, or 1000 and 000, like here in the call sign, uh, maybe the same. So that's already really challenging. Yeah, that what I talked or thought said already in the beginning, and here what I think Turing has already mentioned in 1952, speech recognition, just recognizing the words, is very very different from speech understanding. So if you you but here you need really to understand, not just have all the words. And that well, that was one of the outcomes of Wave One of the CISA project. Yeah, where more than 20 partners from and from industry, from ANSPs, from research, agreed on a so-called ontology. So rules how we want to annotate the semantics of speech utterances. So we agreed on we want to have a call sign, we want to have the types, we want to have values, we want to have our conditions, and so on. So with that, we can then really transform the utterances of this controller into these ontology part and the other one also in that yeah and with that well maybe we see yeah that readback error detection is already much much easier it's not simple still not yeah but or here you can really again try to match strings yeah which is much much easier though the understanding part is then done of course you need an algorithm algorithm which implements here this error you need to transform this into that. But yeah, if that is done, yeah, it's a little bit easier. Of course, yeah, still you have the challenge. You need to understand the 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 art codes and the pilots. Maybe here is an utterance or from real life. Hearing two Delta Zulu, this central level seven zero. Did you got it? Hearing two Delta Zulu, this central level seven zero. Yeah, that was something like that. Yeah, and an ontology part, yeah, it's this year ruling descent seven and flight level. Now listen to the readback of the pilot. Descent is level seven zero, willing to Delta Zulu. Yeah, again. Descent is level seven zero, willing to Delta Zulu. Yeah, yeah, that was the readback of the pilot. So, yeah. And that was a good quality, yeah, believe me, yeah, of a readback. So, that's really the challenge which which you have to fulfill. And well, what we think, if you want to have a successful readback error detection, well, you should have a readback error detection rate of 50%. So if you have 100 readbacks, 51 should be correctly recognized of them. But more challenging is really the false alarm rate, yeah, so, so that the controller really can rely on that tool. So if you have 110 alarms for readback error, then 100 should be correct. That's a challenge. This does not sound so dramatic, but if you think that you only have 2% of the commands which contain readback error, then you have really a challenge. Yeah, Because would that mean, well, on recognition rates on command level for both for ATCOs and for pilots, you need roughly a recognition rate of 50%. But the error rate yeah, must be extremely good. Yeah, of course, between those, you have the rejections, Yeah, where you just say, I do not know. But the error rate must be really below 0.2%. Yeah? 
here you see a little bit of a table which are which error rate and which combination uh, of recognition rate yeah, resides in which false alarm rate. As you see here, the green parts, which really resu result in the 10%, or these uh, shaded parts, which arrive uh, in 20%. So let's see how where Hawaii ends. I think, well, this is really challenging. Maybe we are not achieving it fully, but uh, it's an iterative approach. Yeah. Let me conclude. So I think we still need research on automatic speech recognition in air traffic man management, yeah, because the commercial off-the-shelf uh, tools need to be adapted or we need to develop something by our own, which we have done. Now, though, the co commercial off-the-shelf engines or iPhones and these things, well, they are good, but maybe not at the moment not suited for air traffic management. And speech recognition does not include speech understanding. We need to understand the controllers and the pilots, which might be something different than reading aloud from the newspaper. And in Europe, I think we are preferred with our ontology developed in CESAR 2 in, the, in wave one. Yeah, we can use it or we can wait until we get something better from US or even from China. And I think the readback error detection is a challenge for research and also for the subject matter experts, I hope, which are also now listening. Yeah, because our, we need the inputs, yeah, what is really needed, how, how it helps. Uh, the uh, the end user, uh, what are really readback errors? What should be shown? What should be maybe not shown? So I think for this, an iterative approach uh, is necessary. But we should not wait until we have 100% of uh, readback error detection rate. I think we can already earn now money with that. Save lives. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Hartmut. That was, just, I think, a, an excellent introduction to the to the whole world of uh, you know speech recognition for air traffic control. Now we're going to to go into more detail with different applications through the projects that we have. Uh, so our next speaker, I welcome Ramona Santarelli. She is an aeronautical engineer working for ENAP. So before getting into speech recognition, she actually worked as a guidance and control systems engineer for unmanned vehicles in satellite navigation applications for civil aviation as well. And she has been involved in CESAR for 10 years, yeah, even longer than me. And uh, she, she was actually the leader of Work Package 3 validation infrastructure in CESAR 1. Then she was the chair of the systems engineering reviews for the assessment of our BMV platforms. And in, in CESAR 2020, uh, she, she, went, she became the work package leader for the validation and demonstration engineering. And, uh, and since last year, she is uh, involved in, the, in our project looking at HMI interactions for tower, for the airport tower. So um, Ramona, welcome to, to the stage. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you. Um, I will now share my presentation. Um, let me see if you can uh, see it. We can see it now. Perfect. Good. So, good afternoon, everyone. I am Ramona Santarelli. I'm working for INAV since uh, more than 10 years uh, as an engineer in uh, research activities unit. And uh, since last year, I took over the leadership of Solution 97.2 that I'm going to illustrate uh, hereafter. So as uh, uh, most of us know, the ADCO workload is a limiting factor for the ATC traffic. Uh, nowadays, the controllers need to uh, send uh, instruction via voice to the pilot crews, but also needs to input manually the same uh, uh, instruction to the ATC system. The speech recognition uh, is uh, aimed to avoid this kind of duplication by recognizing the uh, commands given via voice. Cesar has uh, contributed uh, to these uh, research activities uh, since uh, last uh, wave one, as anticipated by Hartmut with the Mallorca project uh, in ex the frame of exploratory research, uh, but also with the uh, project 1604 on the CWP HMI. Uh, this project uh, provided um, promising results along with some recommendation that has been done for wave two. 
so to investigate the speech recognition in a tower environment so with a focus on tower and to use uh, the machine learning in support of uh, common prediction. That's why we have in Web2 the solution 97.2 in the frame of uh, Project 5 um, activities uh, titled uh, Automatic Speech Recognition at the Tower CWP supported by artificial intelligence and machine learning. So the concept as anticipated is a kind of twofold. We have a speech recognition function that takes an audio signal from the CWP and uh, can, uh, is able to transcribe uh, the vocal command into words and then to extract the, con uh, the concept uh, to be input into the ATC system. Uh, this approach uh, is, uh, works good, but uh, still leaves uh, space for uh, some uh, error um, recognition. So we can uh, support this, this function uh, through uh, Kahneman prediction that can be based on machine learning algorithms and can uh, benefit uh, from contextual information such as uh, flight plans, uh, uh, weather information, surveillance, uh, uh, cleared issues and so on in order to figure out a set of uh, possible uh, hypotheses and so in, uh, in this way to uh, speed up uh, the response of the system in recognizing the in, in spotting the uh, um, uh, the command and uh, in uh, um, most important is also to uh, reduce dramatically the error rate in this way, the controllers uh, just need the manual input only in case it needs to correct a wrongly recognized uh, command. So, uh, what uh, we have in the technical solution 97.2 is uh, mm, a set of three technical uh, uh, validations that will be performed uh, in Asker by Indra and uh, Hungaro Control in uh, Brunswick by DLR uh, with uh, before and Copans controllers and uh, in Rome uh, with uh, Sofia Scenario by Leonardo. Uh, they will be performed by the end of this year and the first quarter of next uh, year. Targeting uh, uh, the technology readiness level 4. The environment will cover uh, medium and other airport size with different uh, kinds of uh, air, traf uh, air tra uh, traffic and several uh, even complex airport layout. Uh, we have figured out uh, four use cases that cover mainly the, um, the stepwise approach of this uh, speech recognition engine. So first of all, the highlighting of recognized call sign, the showing of full recognized command into the HMI, and then mainly uh, the, either the acceptance of the speech recognition output or the manual manipulation of a speech recognition output in case of a wrongly recognized command. Uh, it can be noted that the acceptance uh, may occur automatically after a certain uh, timeout of the system, configurable like 10 seconds, 5 seconds, or can be given manually by the controller. Uh, during wave one, the phraseology has been uh, figured out, and uh, now in wave two, it has been extended to tower specifically and uh, consolidated by 97 to team. Anyhow, it can be also uh, noted that uh, machine learning algorithms can also uh, be of help in case of language accent or phraseology deviations. Uh, we foresee to have uh, one ATCO controller in the um, simulation, and we do not, do not uh, foresee uh, changes in the ATCO roles or responsibility, while uh, changes are expected in terms of uh, procedures and interfaces, because the controller now is not uh, uh, nominally is not anymore uh, requested to input uh, um, command uh, manually, but it needs anyhow to check uh, the uh, recognized the command by the um, command recognized by the system. So the, the, the task can be slightly different and requires anyway uh, somehow the attention, but it's not the same as before. So we are trying to introduce some changes in the way of working. 
we expect to have uh, um, a technology assessment, so results uh, in terms of validation reports and uh, CBA by June. Uh, the impacts that we can uh, we, we foresee by the introduction of this kind of automation are uh, can be many. First of all, in the first slide, I was speaking about the workload of the ATCO. We expect to to uh, improve the workload of the ATCO in giving the fact that the clearance recognition reduces the task demand and fatigue. We would like to address also the situational awareness that should be um, reduced um, thanks to this kind of automation, but this, uh, the direction needs to be assessed, let me say, because uh, we need to understand also what happens in case uh, we have several, uh, we, we, we can have several um, wrongly recognized comments. Uh, the human error is also expected to, to get lower because uh, um, the automatic recognition of the, um, and, of, and the clearance recognition and can uh, uh, reduce uh, the human uh, task. So that, um, therefore, fact selection or clearance input uh, are not anymore in the hands of a controller. So the human error is, is expected to get lower. The trust is also um, is also expected to, to be announced, uh, provided that we reach uh, high uh, recognition rates. So in the past, uh, in um, en route and the TMA uh, environment, uh, high um, recognition rates were reached. So we expect the same, and uh, we need to. But anyhow, we need to. Um, to validate the results. So in, um, in the end, uh, we can expect that uh, improving workload, trust, human error and situational awareness, we expect that operational task efficiency of the controller and usability are going to, to, to get uh, some benefit from this uh, uh, automatization. I conclude by saying that we have put in place um, website www.remote-tower.eu that you can uh, uh, navigate for your information or you can even text uh, to me in case needed in case of questions so that's it from my side i would give the floor back to the next uh, to olivia or the next uh, speaker uh, thank you very much ramona so um, that was an overview of uh, what the work we have in terms of bringing the speech recognition to the tower. Now we are going to move over to a radar control environment. And so we're going to have a presentation by two Christians. So I'm going to introduce them both and then they're going to arrange between themselves who talks what. Uh, they both have an operational background. And uh, I think at least um, one of them is still an operational controller. So first, I'll introduce Christian Kern. He joined Eurocontrol in 97, and he became a controller in Vienna Approach. And between 2009 and 2018, he was the manager of the Vienna Approach Control. And there he contributed already to several projects for additional capacity, increased productivity. And he has been collaborating with DLR and others since 2014 in the field that, that we are focusing on today, which is automatic speech recognition. Uh, and at the beginning of 2019, he was assigned director of operations at Austro Control. Uh, our other Christian today is Christian Bindisk. I hope I pronounced that all right. Uh, he's uh, working at Austro Control as a senior expert for planning and development in air traffic control. And he is also a supervisor in Vienna approach. He started with computer science um, at the Technical University of Vienna and finished as a project management education and certification at Danube University, Krems, and he has worked for IBM as a technical trainer for Unix systems. He is a senior specialist for planning ATM systems and takes participation in different international projects like Cesar. So, Christians, welcome to the stage. Thank you very much, Olivia. Uh, 
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, let me just say one thing. I, I never worked for Eurocontrol. I, I always worked for Austrocontrol, but it's my pleasure to do certain projects together with uh, the colleagues from Eurocontrol. Um, and uh, much has been said already about uh, automatic speech recognition. Uh, and now I very much appreciate the opportunity to report about Austrocontrol's efforts in, in this field and uh, for use it for potential use in the air traffic management and our reasoning behind these intentions as an um, air navigation service provider. As uh, Professor Helmke from the German Aerospace Center rightly stated already uh, for good reasons, air navigation service providers are a bit conservative when it comes to completely new technologies. Um, of course, safety is always our top priority in the air traffic management, um, but that doesn't mean that everything may remain like it is forever. And it's uh, pretty much uh, the other way around. Uh, we must develop and improve our ways of working <coughs> continuously and particularly for uh, safety reasons. So uh, that's what we do uh, here as well. And our starting point for our collaboration with our main partner, the German Aerospace Center, uh, was a workshop back in 2014, uh, followed by our participation uh, in the AC Liston project uh, that was mentioned already. And uh, at that time, we were close to the implementation of our fully electronic air traffic management system. So Austria Control was about to complete the transition from uh, the use of paper strips uh, to a fully stripless system. And uh, such system requires an extraordinary number of inputs uh, to be accomplished by the air traffic controllers within a certain time frame. And uh, as we did a lot of training of our personnel to prepare for that transition, we realized that speech recognition uh, could be, could potentially be a very efficient alternative way of doing all these inputs into the system. It's just like we, we know it from, from the iPhone. It's uh, very efficient um, as, as long as it works properly. So uh, based on uh, the experiences we made in the AC Liston project, uh, we started uh, Maloka. Uh, led by the German Aerospace Center and together with uh, many other partners in 2016. Um, also, of course, in the framework of CESAR, Horizon 2020, um, as well as later on the Project 1604, uh, followed by the Project 10, uh, with the two solutions, 96 and 97. And uh, as we speak, we contribute to the Hawaii project that was also mentioned already, uh, in which we are joined by NATS and Iceland Oceanic Control. So funny enough, uh, the projects are not only named after islands, we have uh, participants coming from islands. And uh, at that point, I would like to hand over to my colleague, Christian Windisch, who acted as Austria Control's project leader in all these projects. And uh, he will give you an overview on what we did and especially on what we have achieved in these projects so far. Uh, Christian, may I ask you? Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, hello everyone. Um, together with Christian Kern, um, I have now about uh, seven years of experience in speech recognition for air traffic control. We started in the AC Liston project together with um, yeah, DLR and um, DLR invited us to some uh, simulator, ATC simulator sessions to present us their view of how speech recognition will work in future. And that was the day, time where it worked incredibly good. So after a few days of training as an ADCO, we were able to have a, a validation session without doing any mouse inputs, which increases your capacity incredible. So you can, you can handle as much traffic as you never could before when you have to do all the mouse inputs. So I want to share a little bit my views about our, our projects since the last seven years. Um, when you ask yourself which type of speech recognition I'm talking about is, uh, I'm talking about only the speech recognition of the voice of the ADCO. Um, this is much easier um, because of the speech quality when you have the speech recognition system exactly connected to your voice comm system. 
uh, instead of um, checking the, the pilot's voice, which comes uh, via the frequency, and uh, the quality is much worse than um, the quality from the ADCO. So our, our target was to that the controller has to do no mouse inputs anymore. So he has not to do any command inputs into the system. Um, you see, we're talking about, uh, about numbers a little bit. Um, together with uh, Atkos from Czech, Germany, Austria, we took part in a lot of simulations and um, and I can prove that uh, all the ADCOs, including myself, we were really impressed. Um, with speech recognition, we could accept an amount of traffic we normally never would be able to handle. Um, DLR, as a scientific and research institution, gathered tons of numbers, statistics, and uh, yeah, I could present you thousands of pages, uh, but to make it short, for me, as a non-mathematic genius, uh, there are two practical statistics, easy to understand and which makes the sense, which presents the sense for the speech recognition. Um, first, the workload. Um, when you don't have to do all the mouse inputs, it reduces your workload. Um, we made not only this NASA TLX tests, we already made a lot of other different tests and all of the tests we made uh, said that the reduction is, the workload reduction is something between, yeah, let's say 20, 30% and the mental workload reduction is even higher. Um, as an ADCO, safety is number one. I understand that uh, okay, I'm now working for a lot of projects in, in ATC. I understand that a good business plan is also important, but as an ADCO, um, number one is safety. And when you would have a speech recognition system doing mouse inputs into the system, um, you need a really high recognition rate. Uh, and most important, the error rate. Um, for an NSP, you have three, when you look on uh, speech recognition, you have three important numbers. Of course, the recognition rate, you have the error rate and the rejection rate. Uh, you can imagine um, the rejection rate is like when the system says, I have no clue what you're talking about. Uh, that's it. That is okay, because uh, if the system has no idea, it presents to you, I don't know what you're talking about. Do it yourself. That's fine. Uh, recognition rate, of course, is also fine. Error rate is not a good idea um, because um, when the system makes an input, uh, let's say you're clearing your clearance is Lufthansa one two three climb flight level two four zero, and the input is two two zero, um, then this is not a good idea. Um, but we learned from other um, projects, we know that um, the, the error rate of ADCOs doing mouse inputs is today around 6%. So when you consider this, you see that the error rate of speech recognition is already below. Even today, it would be safer to have the mouse inputs done automatically by the system instead by the ADCOs. Um, I want to give another short comment on the question um, about CPTLC. Um, we decided to make all our exercises for approach um, because we found uh, that uh, the best effort we had in high density areas, and that's normally approach. Um, Speech recognition and CPTLC uh, coexist together. Um, you just have to tell the system if you want a command delivered via voice or via CPTLC. 
For example, if you want to send it via CPTLC, press a button on the keyboard. And by the way, I bet I'm faster to speak a complex command to an aircraft instead of clicking it with the mouse. Um, CPTLC is not designed for high density units and clicking uh, high complex commands, but it works with um, air speech recognition with CPTLC will also work. Um, so to broaden our view a little bit, what does this mean for the stakeholders and the benefits for the NSB itself? A big benefit can be achieved for the airlines. We measured during all of the validations in high density TMAs, an average saving of 50 to 65 liters of kerosene per flight. Calculated for high density airports with more than 1000 movements a day, this would cons conservatively calculated means per year, 20 million liters of kerosene saved. The biggest impact in public perception are the savings of real big amount of CO2. Overall, more than 40,000 tons per year. Um, why this? Why do we have these calculations? Uh, because of less flying time in the TMA. When you, as an ad, when, has, when the ADCO has more time to focus on his work and there's no need of mouse clicking anymore, he has a higher capacity. Higher capacity means um, a lower or shorter flying time for the airlines. Um, for the NSPs, it means, yeah, significant reduction of ADCO workload, which on the other side means increase of sector capacity. And there's something that is an idea we discussed. Um, when you can reduce the workload, you can also increase a possible working lifetime. Um, and of course, there's always a business pressure coming also from the airports. We can handle about uh, two landings per hour more, which means if a big airport can sell two additional slots per hour, that's a lot of money. So, Christian, please. Uh, thank you, Christian. Uh, uh, code training. So, uh, safety was... Uh, mentioned repeatedly and uh, as we just heard speech recognition is almost uh, mature enough to use it in the air traffic management however um, it is still challenging to use it in in the live traffic situation and uh, because of that in our opinion it makes much sense to firstly use it in the ADCO training at uh, the simulator and uh, respectively use it in a non-safety critical situation here at the simulator we have an environment without the need for authority approval and, and stuff like that from the beginning uh, but is still a very appropriate testing environment and at the same time uh, we have the possibility to gain some significant benefits already in terms of cost reduction for instance uh, we think that with such highly quality automatic speech recognition we can uh, significantly reduce the number of uh, the required and, and also costly so-called pseudo-pilots. Um, almost everybody in, 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 in the room will know about the, the pseudo-pilots, uh, the persons that uh, control the flights in a, in a training exercise. By, by using speech recognition, uh, we can substitute them uh, to a far extent. Uh, so um, we think we can as well offer additional training hours for our students at the same cost uh, as they do not need these pseudo-pilots uh, to run their exercise. Uh, they, for instance, can do their exercises in parallel and not uh, behind each other, like when using the same set of, of, of these pseudo-pilots. Um, there's another quality benefit. Uh, to make uh, speech recognition work more properly for you, you should use the prescribed phraseology, and therefore students are better trained to do so. Uh, that is, uh, by the way, 
the same what counts for air traffic controllers in uh, live traffic uh, also. Uh, but we know that speech recognition will have to be uh, resilient to some extent when it uh, comes to little deviations from the prescribed physiology. Uh, that's, that's another challenge for our engineers, as, as uh, uh, Hartmut already pointed out before. Uh, having said that, uh, back to you, Christian, for some uh, deep, uh, deeper uh, technological insights into how it works. Yes. Um, why does this work so good? Um, there's a big difference uh, between um, when you use your Alexa or Siri or whatever, and you're doing this for ATC. I want to give you a short overview. Um, first, we only use speech recognition engines for recognizing Edco's vo voice, as I told. Uh, that's much easier. Um, second, the range of, of possible words and commands is much smaller than for Alexa. If you want to ask Alexa whatever you want, she should give an answer. Um, for the recognition of Edco's command, the range is much smaller. Um, and the third, and I guess the biggest um, thing is, um, the system uses additional information to increase the recognition rate. So, for example, when you have only one Lufthansa just departed at the airport and the controller gives a command, Lufthansa 123, climb flight level 240. And in this case, the system has the radar and the flight, pla flight plan information. Then it knows that the climb of flight level 240 will most probably not be the one for the Air Force descending inbound to Vienna, because on the radar, there's only one Lufthansa just departed. And when you combine, so when you combine additional information from radar, flight data, uh, flight plans, weather, so the QNH, for example, um, then you can come to these numbers I previously presented. So recognition rates ab high above 90% and error rates much below what a controller can do with the mouse. Um, that is also a, um, we had in, in CESA, we had in this project 1604, I guess. Yeah, uh, we had validations with COTS products, so off the shelf products where you, which you can buy uh, today. This will never work because you, we had recognition rates half of it, um, you need this additional information to train a system to have this high recognition rates, which we need as an ADCO. Yeah. Um, so that's in just simple words, why this works. Um, I didn't believe this seven years ago uh, when we had the first uh, simulations uh, at the DLI in Braunschweig, uh, we saw that this approach with additional information feed it into the, into, the, into the server makes these great numbers. And I just can say it's simply, it works. I, yeah. Um, Christian. Thank you, Christian. Um, uh, just a quick wrap up now from my side on uh, what has been said already. The integration into the ADCO training, in our opinion, is less challenging, but uh, lets us gain some uh, cost benefits already. Uh, what we need is a voice communication system uh, with an interface to connect, uh, sorry, to connect external systems. Uh, this is something we can expect to have it available at Astro Control in the near future. And uh, then there's one final requirement, and uh, this appears to be uh, one of the biggest challenges. It's the integration into the air traffic management system. Uh, here at Austro Control, we run uh, a Thales Topska system together with our partners from the Coupons Alliance. And uh, we will finally need an interface to make automatic speech recognition work seamlessly uh, together with this system. Um, here I can really talk from experience over many years uh, that the CESA program gives a, 
as a framework um, where all required partners can efficiently work together and uh, find solutions to, to overcome these challenges. Also, SWIM uh, could be part of this solution, as it is indicated here on the slide. On the next slide, thank you, Christian, uh, you see an overview on the actual project Austro Control is in. As uh, already mentioned, the CESA 2020 Project 10, uh, Solution 96, with our intention to enter the ops room uh, for the integration of the speech recognition test system. Uh, today, the automatic speech recognition server is already connected to the ATC voice communication and also the surveillance system. So, uh, to get a proof of concept, we record live data from the voice communication system and feed our speech recognition engine with that data. And uh, by doing so, we can prove the readiness of the system for potential use in live traffic. During these uh, validations, the speech recognition results uh, will be presented in the ops room to the controllers in real time uh, to get their feedback afterwards. This is, of course, uh, very important to have. I thank you very much uh, for your attention to this point. I would like to end with our conclusions. We see significant benefits of a later use of automatic uh, speech recognition in the air traffic management, as it in simulations has already proven to reduce the ADCO workload and it relieves ADCOs from a lot of cognitive load. So there is a gain of capacity in a more congested sectors. Uh, that, of course, reduces also cost uh, through a more efficient use and an increased productivity of the ATCOs. As we manage to detect readback errors and uh, reduce mouse error rates, uh, we will improve safety. And as we mentioned before, it increases uh, efficiency in ATCO training. And uh, this seems uh, to be not far away from being realized. And, uh, because of the high potential of this technology from the perspective of an air navigation service provider, Austro Control will continue to support the development uh, and the integration of automatic speech recognition into the air traffic management system. And we do this uh, uh, in the framework of CISA uh, that has really proven to be an enabler for such technology and therefore for gaining all, all these uh, benefits. I thank you very much for your attention. And uh, we're, of course, happy to answer questions you might have. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, back to you, Olivia. Thank you very much, Christian. That was uh, very informative about the Vienna approach experience. So now we're going to jump over to Spain to uh, Raquel Garcia Eras. She's going to tell us about the uh, specific, a very specific application that, that Crida is working on. So Raquel is an ATM research and development engineer. She has been working for 15 years in this domain, and she has been working in, in validation of ATM system using both real-time and fast-time simulations, gaming, live trials, shadow mode. Uh, she actually joined the speech recognition team uh, project in 2016, and uh, she's going to tell us about their experience and what they are working on. Raquel, the floor is yours. Thank you, Olivia. So. I am going to present one very specific uh, use case that we have already speak about. My other partners is regarding illuminating flights using speech recognition. What we are saying about illuminating flight using speech recognition is that we want to illuminate flights that are in contact with the controller. And why do we want to highlight and identify them? Mainly to increase safety. The objective is that controllers quickly identify new flights requesting their sector or flight crews entering their sectors or flight crews requesting action from them by illumination or highlighting the flights on the controller working position. We can focus on new trends produced by the flight crew. In this case, controllers have several aircraft under their responsibility. Depending on the capacity of the sector, they may have 10, 20 or even 25 flights on the frequency at the same time. A tool that helps the controller to focus her attention on the aircraft calling increases her situational awareness, supporting the perception and comprehension of the flight situation. We can also use controller utilities providing commands or information to the flight crew. In this case, the flight illumination on the console is a means to provide a safety check for the controller, ensuring that the flight 
they are addressing is the one that they intend to. But why do we want to use voice recognition to perform this task? Identifying the flights that are speaking can be performed in different ways. One already used by some air navigation service providers is using radiogoniometers. A radiogoniometer is an instrument which, when coupled to an antenna system, enables the identification of the beating of the incident radio waves. This system is very reliable, but is expensive and can get, get very expensive if you need to cover a big country. Voice, on the other hand, is free and is something that controllers and flight crew constantly use in their interactions. A voice recognition system is not free, but it is not as expensive and can be easily deployed on the controller working positions, as it is set contains modules that use already existing information from the console. Voice recognition is present in a right day to day. It is natural to think that air navigation can take advantage of this technology. As communication between controllers and flight crew follows a specific procedures and language. For this reason, NR decided to explore together with Krita and Indra the use of voice recognition in the Survey 2 PROSA project in solution 96 that is centered in the root path. In this solution, led by Leonardo, several companies are investigating the benefits of using voice recognition in the controller working position for different purposes. In our case, we are analyzing the benefits of three different use cases identifying and highlighting call signs from the flight crew uterans, identifying and highlighting call signs from the controller uterans, and providing an historical annotation of the radio transmission exchange with the aircraft. Apart from the benefits of previously indicated on situational awareness and safety, we also expect that the implementation of this service will support the familiarization of the controllers with the speech recognition technology in their working environment before its possible incorporation in, in functions with high-end automation as common recognition that we have already talked about. So how can we identify flight and illuminate it? We have to search for the name. In aeronautical procedures, all conversation between controllers and flight crew must contain the flight identification. Each flight has an identification, which is usually the call sign. The call sign is not the name of the aircraft, but the name of the flight, and it's similar to the one on your tickets when you type travel. The call sign is composed of two parts. The first, the account name of the company, and a group of letter and numbers to differentiate between the different flights of the same company. So this flight, the first one, is from Iberia, and the call sign of the name is Iberia 12 Alpha Tango. The aeronautical alphabet is used to pronounce the letters to ensure that they are correctly understood. But as, but as in most other aspects of life, you can call a flight with different names, and the speech recognition must be able to identify them. Iberia 12 Alpha Tango, while flying over Spain or a Spanish native speaking country, can also be addressed as Iberia 12 Alpha Tango. Using local language, when the flight crew and the controller will understand them, is allowed by ICAO although it impacts on the situation awareness as not all the people listening to the radio will be able to understand it. But even if we use one language, we can still call the same flight using different approaches. This next flight is from British Airways. It's British Airways 501, but British Airways radio name is a speed bear due to a previous law of the company. Controllers can and will refer to this flight as a speed bear 501. Those of you that are familiar with call signs will say, I know the last one. It is a flight from Irlingus, the national flag carrier for Ireland. And Irlingus is now on the radio waves of Shamrock due to the clover of Shamrock on the tails of the, its aircraft. So the call sign is Shamrock 100, or it could be Shamrock 100, or Shamrock 10 0, or Echo India November 100, because yes, you can spell the call signs. Imagine a charter company from another country that only comes once a year. It could be difficult to know the radio name just by the call sign. Nevertheless, controllers must be able to address the flight so they will spill it. This is similar to what Harmus has said. It's not the same hearing it as understanding what is sent. Now, second step. Although it seems that flights are alone in the sky when you are in one of them, there is a huge amount of people, computers, systems, and information supporting it. And you should take advantage of it when possible. Thank you, Tom, 
take into account the environment. Controllers know which flights will enter the airspace within the next period of time. Flights must be have a flight plan to be allowed to go up in the skies. And this information is provided to all the people and systems that need to be aware of the flight, such as the destination airport and all the controllers that will contact the flight and off its path. This information can be used by a speech recognition in two ways. To improve the probability of recognizing the call signs by providing it as an input and as a double check that the speech recognition has not wrongly identified a non-existing flight. As I said, controllers and flight crew follow a specific aeronautical procedures when speaking to each other. This is the ICAO document 4444. Among several things, it indicates that when communications are initiated by controllers, they must start by the identification or call sign of the flight being addressed and continue by using the commands with its qualifiers or information. For example, Alitalia 61 Romeo Papa, descent flight level 250. Flight crew must provide a readback. This is an knowledge that they, are, they have understood the command and will proceed accordingly. This readback starts by the command with its qualifiers and ends with the identification or call sign of the flight. The answer to the previous command will be descending to flight level 250, Alitalia 61 Romeo Papa. When the flight crew initiates communication with the controllers, they will start the communication with the call sign and follow it with the necessary information. Flight crew can initiate communications for several reasons. They must always call air traffic control when they are about to enter a new sector. They make a, they make a call prior to the boundary between both airspace. Flight crew communicates this with the controller to make her aware of this presence and confirm the voice communication is feasible for emergency use. In this communication, flight crew will typically greet the controller and provide some information related to the flight. For example, good morning, the Portugal 9035, flight level 300. Flight crew can start communication anytime with the controller to request modifying vertical, horizontal trajectories or speed to fly at the optimum performance of the aircraft. Or because of adverse weather, like encountering communal limbus and severe turbulence, icing, etc. I, I Europa 6 Alpha Bravo requesting flight level 400 due to server turbulence. So now you know the grammar and the language model. We, we know where to look for the call sign at the beginning of the phrase for controllers or at the beginning or the end for flight crew. You can use this information to again optimize your speech recognition model. And finally, take into account the waves. When a controller speaks to the system, he is speaking directly to a microphone near his mouth. There may be some background noise in the room, but not really much, as all the people in the control room are usually quite concentrated on their task. But think of the flights. The flight crew speaks to the aircraft microphone that sends a radio communication via wave to reception antennas situation situated on the ground, and these antennas send the communication to the control centers. Flights on the airport and near the antennas are the easy ones. But flights can be far away from the recep reception antennas. Do you know when you are on your car traveling and moving away from your town and try to fine tune your favorite radio station? Yeah, it can be that bad. Good news is that we are in the 21st century and continuously improving the air traffic management world and even the radio reception is improving. Air navigation service providers have several antennas and can choose the one with better signal to radio noise, signal to noise radio, sorry. The transmission from the antenna to the control centers was analogical, but now it has moved to the digital world. So the communications that we revise on the ground from pilots, even if still challenging, is better than some years ago. Now you have all the elements. You just need to build your system. The image is the architecture of the system that we are using to explore calls and recognition within the CSR project. As I said, it is jointly developed by ANER, the Spanish air navigation service providers, Indra and Crida. The audio injected in the recognition systems comes from the communication system available in ANER, Cometa. The audio incorporates a flag that indicates if it is coming from a controller or a flight crew. The selection of the signal with lower noise has already been performed in previous steps. 
The Flight Data Processing System, FDP, provides the dynamic information regarding the flight plans with the call signs that are of interest for the sector selected, selected in that moment. Although we are exploring call sign detections, there are other uses, use cases with speech recognition and more information of interest can be extracted from the flight plans or provide, provided via offline, such as the destination airport or waypoints that the aircraft will overfly. Our recognition model a recognition system has two models. One optimizes for controller's communication and one optimizes for flight crew communications. They use a recognition technology from the European Media Laboratory, EML, a German company, and has been developed jointly with CRIDA. The language model and classes are class basis models that take into account the characteristics that we have already discussed previously. The acoustic model is a multilingual model able to understand both English and Spanish. We do not have one model for each language as we don't know in, in advance if the communication will be in Spanish or English. The lexicon includes all the words of aeronautical interest, such as the aeronautical alphabet. And there is an algorithm that detects the call signs and checks that the call sign is within the possible flights. Once the flight has been identified, the information is sent to the console for illumination. The control model is a mature model that has been trained along several years and reaches a call sign detection rate of nearly 90%. While the pilot model is a new model developed in 2020, this model is nearly 50% recognition rate, both models in operational recordings. Now you have everything in place, so just illuminate your flight. The image on the screen is the console from a controller during a simulation that took place in 2020. The sector is the area with darker background. I don't know if you see it. And you can see several flights that are already in contact with the controller, about to enter or of interest for him. You can distinguish them by the color. So if you are a controller that is considered in two aircraft that may have a problem, and suddenly a flight calls you, Ryanair 50 Sulu November, requesting flight level 309. Okay. Hopefully, speech recognition can support you in identifying it. Current implementation displays a circle around the radar track of the flight, as you have seen, and the circle splices for five seconds and then it disappears. Up to five call signs can be recognized and displayed at the same time on the console. Why five? Because we really do not think more than five conversations with five different aircraft can take place in less than five seconds. And why five seconds? because it's the number that the controllers accessing the projects have provided. But this may be too distracting when you are working. And there are other options, as illuminating the part of the label where the call sign appears, instead of the radar track. The research is still needed to confirm some choices that we are selecting and to improve the models that we are developing. Illuminating flights using speech recognition is one use case that we believe will improve safety in our skies and pave the way to use it in other applications in the air traffic management world. So thank you very much for listening. Thank you. Thank you very much, Raquel. So now I think, uh, oh, we are now here all on stage. We um, are running a bit late, as is often the case, but I still think we have time for, for some questions. I have been monitoring the questions. Thank you very much for everybody for sharing your questions, curiosity, concern. And uh, many questions have been answered, some have not. Um, I, I'm gonna try to aggregate a little bit. Uh, first, I'd like to ask Harmut, we've had lots of questions about the issue of the accents, how you build your databases. Also considering that there are not so many ATCOs, uh, Harmut, would you consider like having a training that's specific to a country or even an ATCO because you actually, you know which ATCO is talking because they register on the screen. So would you consider uh, specifically tailoring it to each ATCO or is just tailoring it to the national accent enough or can you make a speech recognition that's good, the same for everybody? Well, you need to know uh, who is speaking. Uh, the, what we did, for example, in the Mallorca project, we trained especially for also control a model. We especially trained a model for Czech controllers. And uh, we used the Czech model for the also control controllers just for demonstration purposes and vice versa. This was a complete failure. Yeah, that does not work. If we create a, if we can create a combined model, okay, 
you have less performance uh, for us, uh, for both, but only small less performance. But then you can use it for more. But if then a Chinese controller is coming, you might get still your problems because if you have not trained for special accents, you are lost. Yeah, for example, or with Spanish controllers, I think we will have our challenges because we have them not in our databases. So Croatia controllers, which we had, are not a problem. We expected the problems, but maybe that's more similar to, to the Czech uh, controllers, which we have. We also had some trials where we trained specially on Mr. Miller or Mrs. Or I don't know. Yeah, though so if we know a special model for, for people, uh, well, you can really reduce the word error rate or if you know who is speaking but only slightly yeah? so people say by 10 percent relatively although yeah? so if you have 10 percent of word error rate maybe you can go to nine percent uh, with that but if then somebody else is speaking then you have a problem so it might be it must be correct okay thank you very much that's very clear um then i'll, I'll i'd like to jump over to ramona and um, you're the only one here who has been talking about the tower environment. And I would like to ask you how you compare. So what do you, what's the specificity of the tower? And uh, I'm gonna just shoot in the air. Maybe tower controllers walk around more. Does that make a difference? Do they enter commands less uh, because they're walking sometimes, especially in a smaller tower where they have to look around, you know, for, visual traffic or is that not a consideration or or why what is different or is it the same would you say it's the same the challenges and the and the opportunities i was muted so for the tower controller we need to take in consideration the fact that uh, the improvement uh, being brought by automatization can help to reduce the head down time so we can uh, leave the controller with uh, hopefully a better uh, enhanced uh, situational awareness in uh, uh, looking out of out the window and uh, this can be a, a kind of a differentiation aspect uh, i think uh, that uh, that can be uh, different from the um, uh, en route and tma controller so it can be um, yeah, mainly, mainly this aspect, I would say. Mm -hmm. And do you see it like in, in, in a way integrated to the other aspects that you're having, like because your project is looking at all kinds of, of HMI improvements for the tower? Is, is this, uh, you know, more promising, integrated? I mean, like compared to this idea of the tracking labels, for example, or other HMI improvements for tower? Or is it like, um, are they like separate modules that you can mix and match, but have nothing, no relationship between them? So in the, under the project five uh, work package three, we are also investigated um, other uh, kinds of uh, technologies, uh, such as uh, the virtual reality that um, has also something to do with the uh, interface of the tower. So we have uh, figured out that these uh, technologies can be put together and are not uh, um, annoying each other, let's say. So they can be uh, um, constructive uh, for, the, for the tower controller and uh, can um, coexist. So. Oh, thank you. Yeah. That's uh, actually there. It's just very interesting technologies. I, I think that uh, it's just really interesting that that you have so many new things for Tawa, and that's why I think the speech recognition is actually adding more and more that I think looks very promising. Thank you. Um, I, now, just I would like to jump over to the to the Christians, and I don't know who to ask this to. I mean, you've been giving some spectacular figures about the workload reduction and and the. And it's, it's clear that, that you have been very impressed by the performance. Um, I saw someone ask a question I had in my mind, and I would like to, to connect it to the overall operating method. So when you say, for instance, you know, Lufthansa 1, 2, 3, turn left heading 1, 2, 0, is that you, that's recognized? And then you have to click OK, or is that automatically input? Do you have to, you know, do like this with your... Uh, 
and uh, and then the other the other question is like I think we all have the experience when we talk to to our Siri that you kind of learn to talk to Siri and you realize that some things work and some things don't work. Um, have you noticed in your trials that controllers tend to start changing the way they talk so that this that the recognizer understands more or as soon as there is traffic, they kind of forget there's a recognizer going on and uh, they speak as always. Or do you foresee uh, an, an evolution? And also, do you enter all commands? Or sometimes there are some commands that if you're very busy, you wouldn't enter. And thanks to the speech recognition, then everything will be entered in the system, everything that's recognized, of course. So it's, you know, maybe three questions, but all together about the operating method. Um, just Okay, I will start with um, putting all the commands into the system. Um, one of the problems when we searching for a solution in high density times was that when uh, an ADCO was very stressed, they started to um, canceling some mouse inputs. So they were not doing all the necessary mouse inputs into the system just to save time. And that's on the one hand, a safe safety problem because a lot of safety nets in a modern ATM system rely on the data. Um, and that was where we found out, find that uh, speech recognition is a good solution because when you have you, you nearly have 100% in of the commands in the system. And we had during our validations, we had a lot of um, discussions with all the ad calls from Vienna, Praha and so on. And uh, there were two opinions. One, the opinion was um, some of the ad calls said, okay, we want to have it presented in a label. And then we want to to click on a confirm button before it's sent into the system. And other controller says, okay, I had a session with 100% recognition rate. I don't need this anymore. I don't want it. I just send it directly into the system. And uh, I think we got a compromise. Um, for the time, our idea is we present it in the label for some seconds. If you don't correct it after two, three, four, whatever seconds, it's sent automatically into the system. Christian? Mm. Oh, that's really interesting. Yeah. The other Christian, did you want to complement? Uh, just just wanted to add on, on uh, should, should uh, the automatic speech recognition adopt to the controllers or should the controllers adopt to the, to, to the machine? Uh, and I think the best way forward would, would be to, to uh, find us somewhere in the middle from, from the perspective of, of a controller, um, we have to, to admit that many occurrences have their reasons in, in, in a deviation from prescribed phraseology. Uh, the phraseology is prescribed in a way um, with much sense and, and much investigations have taken place before and the phraseology is there for a very good reason. And normally as a controller, you should stick to it. So if uh, automatic speech recognition reminds you of that and works more properly if you if you if you stick to that um, safety is also increased but on the other on the other hand of course uh, we all know that in on a long working day you not always say each word like it should be and and uh, that's uh, also a challenge and, and something um, the specification of uh, speech recognition has to take into account uh, and has to be uh, resilient to some extent, as, as, as I said in the presentation, uh, to, to these uh, at least little deviations from what is prescribed. Uh, okay, thank you, Christian. That's um, really interesting. I, I just would like now to jump over to Raquel. And uh, I mean, you gave some, you know, first data on, on the recognition of the pilot call sign, which I think you said was 50%. As yes. opposed to when when it's the pilot talking, let's say, uh, whereas it's ninety percent when it's the controller talking. Um, what would you is this because the pilots have many accents, or would you say, for instance, that if you if you're in Spain, you understand all the Iberia, <laughs> and you yeah, but but you don't understand 
uh, and you understand the usual airlines that fly there and then the strange you know like strange accents that don't fly there so much you don't understand or is it the vhf noise because obviously the controller's voice is you know clean because you know it doesn't come to vhf but the but the pilot is or is it a combination of, of both combination it's a combination of both obviously the call signs that are more set in the in the environment at Iberia, Ryanair and so on all these have better training also in the so the model the data of the training appears more more times so it's better training to recognize this this different type of type of eyes and the different people pronouncing pronunciating pronunciating the names okay but it's also the radio waves because uh -huh. you all know that the pilots and conversation especially with bad weather can be very very nicey and it's very difficult to recognize many times controllers recognize the name of the call uh, the call sign being not raised or what the pilot is saying because of the context of what is being said so we we have we have a combination of both first the accents of the different people with different accents also the the common that the company is within the environment and it, the well train that is the expected recognition with this environment and also the noise the background noise uh, oh, thank you and i'm going to ask something silly so once when when pilot has talked once you know and uh, maybe you didn't recognize it first time but obviously the, the controller maybe did something to the flight and you would be able to know that that's the flight apart from whether you do this for training the mo you can use this data for training the model afterwards um you, you know for us controllers we also recognize the voice of the pilot so if he's a person behind is that is that kind of timbre or you know the specifics of the voice of the of the pilot something you could use to recognize this next time that he calls meaning that may you know or is it it is pure speech recognition does that make any sense Harmut is looking at me i think it's very early to go so deep recognize the people mm -hmm. yeah. and maybe we have data protection issues with that i don't know yeah, yeah, it's just that something that we we use, you know, it's something that a, that a human would use. So that's why I was just asking. Um, Harmut, would you? Does that make any sense? Because I know that Hawaii is looking also at the timbre in terms of uh, recognizing stress levels or workload, mm -hmm. uh, or some something else that's not just a speech recognition. So does that does this make any sense? Yeah, well, for, for, for the call sign recognition or to recognize the pilot, of course, that makes uh, sense. Or so for the humans, I, I think it's also easier. So if you hear, hear a Spanish accent or not really recognizing the call sign, you have already an idea which of the two barriers are, are, are there. So then you, you are listening, of course, uh, uh, to that. But I, I think that's just at the moment minor improvements. Which we will get though from the 99 to the or for the 90 to the 91 percent. Uh, I think we at the moment we have other challenges, uh, which we have to look uh, f first on. Yeah, I think one of the problems, uh, what I see on the pilot side, for example, is uh, if controllers are already very innovative with their phraseology, then pilots are much more innovative. Yeah, what, what they are abbreviating, they they are nearly never saying the Iberia. It's just for alpha or something like that. Yeah, you just recognize and two letters, and you just need to know that there is only a four alpha from Iberia, and they also give always a call sign mostly at the end. Yeah, that makes it also difficult. Yeah, because uh -huh. then you have to recognize all the other stuff, and if you are not recognizing that, you are also not recognizing the two alpha. So on pilot side, it's really challenging. Good luck, Raquel. Thank you. And uh, just a, as a closing question, we are almost out of time. Uh, there were many comments on the CBDLC. So maybe I can ask anybody to jump in and tell me whether they think they're competing or complementary technologies. So are we moving towards a, 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 you know, like we don't talk so much on the phone anymore? And we will probably in the future not be issuing so many clearances via voice. So Christian, uh, please. Um, we, dis we talked a lot about this um, during our validation runs. Um, 
and uh, the output was mostly that uh, both of the system can coexist because um, CPDLC works and, and speech recognition will also work in the near future. Um, you just have to think about that um, you're, when you make a complex command to a pilot, uh, then it takes much more time to do this with mouse clicking. Um, it's much faster to have a complex command to send via voice. And you can tell the system by, let's say, using a keyboard, uh, you press some button on the keyboard and whatever you say now is not sent out from the COM system, but it will be sent out from the CPDLC system. So this works and you are still much faster than uh, with clicking with the mouse. Olivia, you already have give the answer by your own. Or I think you're expecting now an answer by voice from us. Or should I type it, my answer? <laughs> no, of course not. So, uh, yeah, voice or for 10,000 years is the most efficient way yeah. how humans are communicating. And we are still walk, want to talk to humans. But on the other hand, if the ATCO is said, uh, direct to 69 north, 56.3 west, uh, then go to 56.9 uh, left, uh, east. And then uh, though if you got all these coordinates, in the direct clearances of course that's nonsense uh, for the pilot or of course he has a co-pilot who can maybe can write everything down with that i think you can combine that the speech recognizer transformed that into yeah uh, what should be sent out by cpdlc and then then you just send it out but i would say the ad the adco does not want to write everything down with clicking he just wants to talk to the system via voice and if it works and what we found out, of course, in, in a high density approach area, it does not work with CPDLC because uh, if you send a command to the aircraft, there is no 30 seconds until the aircraft is turning. That will not work. So we tested the, the benefit, to be honest, is for high density airport, high density traffic. In low traffic situations, it's nice to have a system who makes the mouse inputs for you, but there's no, let's say, no cost, no cost benefit out from it. Thank you very much. That's uh, very clear. Just from the CPDLC, we obviously right now we are in an environment where CPDLC is meant for for the end route and uh, for not time critical clearances. We are working, however, and we have a lot of work in Cesar towards you know reducing the latency to less than one second, basically, and, and to making things fast. So it it will be as fast as as voice. But I think uh, I I would say from the controller point of view. It uh, makes sense to say they're complementary. And I don't know if you do this, but I do dictate my SMS messages all the time. So that I think that makes a lot of sense. Thank you very much, everybody. I'm afraid we are not only at the end of our time, but three minutes over time. Just to say, um, as I already said, all the, all the questions that have not been answered in, in, in today, we'll strive at answering them within the next few days. And uh, everything will be published together with the replay and the slides as well for for your review and uh, stay tuned we're we are having a lot of uh, webinars we aim at staying connected and uh, we love hearing from you so anything just uh, connect with us thank you very much thank you olivia thank, thank you everybody. You. thank you olivia goodbye thank you very thank much you.